It feels like I haven't done a review or a more analytical game related video in ages. The recently released and almost controversial multiplayer pirate game Sea of Thieves seems to be a good opportunity to change this. As always I'm late but my view of the game is also a lot more complete because I had more time to play, know about what reaching pirate legend has to offer and have seen Rare's roadmap for future content. But why is it so controversial? Sea of Thieves is a strange game. I would say it's even difficult to name its genre. If I would make a classical review it would sound like this. Great foundation and gorgeous water but not enough content. Thank you for watching and see you next time Space Cowboy. But what does not enough content actually mean and why do so many people agree on this criticism? In my opinion this question is a bit difficult to answer and also relatively subjective so a good opportunity to talk about the concept of content in games in more detail. What comes first to my mind is that some people like the idea of shorter games as long as the game is a blast to play for those let's say 10 hours. What if in theory the 10 to 15 hours Sea of Thieves you get out of it are the best 10 to 15 hours in a video game you had in years. Does it really matter if it becomes boring after that? I would say at least some people would say no. But why is the perception of Sea of Thieves amount of content among most critics so similar? And not only that, I would also agree. This made me thinking a lot and I could not put my finger on it because most critics really like the foundation and compliment the game as a blast to play with friends for a short amount of time. The most obvious reason for this is the price and the fact that the game has no direct ending. You can't play through it which evokes the idea that it's made to be played endlessly. Other very successful games have spoiled us a bit in this regard. When it comes to price I think it's $60 in the US, here in Germany and other countries in Europe I have to pay 70 euros for it that are about 84 to 86 dollars. In my opinion that's really expensive and let's not talk about Australia. Of course $60 for a console game does not seem totally out of proportion but for a PC game it's a different story. But what about games like Uncharted 4 or the newer Tomb Raider games and alike? They often are also about 10 to 15 hours and cost $60 on release. Why are they not considered not enough content? And here I think lies an interesting answer to this problem but also an interesting insight to game design and standards of the gaming communities these days. It's quite difficult to explain so I have to go far afield. For my first point I would introduce the idea of splitting the content a game can have into several categories or layers. Let's start with the layer of basic game mechanics. So what you do in the game to play it, its core game design. The narrative layer, so story, plot, backstory, dialogues and characters. The acoustic communication layer, this is sound design, voice acting and music. The visual communication layer, art style, graphics, animation and UI. The technical layer, is the game well optimized, how do the controls feel but also netcode, matchmaking options and so on. The level design layer, level design and exploration which is tied to the game mechanics but somehow it's also its own thing. The balance layer, good balance gives players options and have influence on how fun a game is. The problem solving variety layer, stupid name but games are about solving problems in a more direct or abstract way. The variety of this also counts as content for me. In my opinion variety is so important that I wanted it in a separate layer. Think of enemy and boss variety but also the variety of tools and interactions you have. The game length stretching layer, strange name too but present for decades. So basically elements that are purely there to stretch the playtime or imply some sort of replay value like collectibles, special unlocks and challenges, achievements and so on. This also touches the player's progress in a game. The multiplayer layer, cooperative and competitive modes and interactions requiring multiple real players. The post launch support layer, patches, balance changes and free additional content and so on. There are more layers but you get the basic idea. All those layers can be in a game and define its content. 
if we would now make a chart with the presence or intensity of each layer, we could see that depending on the game, every layer would have a different intensity, including being zero. There are narrative driven games where the story layer peaks, but probably not the game mechanics. And there are games that are only driven by game mechanics, but have no narrative layer. If we now look at modern AAA games, especially iterations of the same franchise or even different franchises of the same genre, we will quite often see a very similar pattern. What we see would be a lot of peaks. Think of games like Call of Duty. They have everything. Story, characters, impressive graphics, mocap cutscenes with good voice acting, multiplayer modes, collectibles, post-launch support, game mode variety, some are also very polished technically and so on. From my observation, AAA games tend to have a high content bandwidth. That is a term or metaphor I want to use when a lot of those layers are present in a game. A peak in this context must be content the developers focused on. And these days, AAA developers focus on almost every possible aspect. Sony sometimes leaves the multiplayer aspect out, while others follow the philosophy that every game they make must have a multiplayer component. One part of my theory is now that over the years we became used to a few specific patterns when we hear AAA game and have to pay $60 or more for it. You could almost say there are standards the gaming community expects. And even if a AAA game is just 10 to 15 hours long and has no multiplayer, they at least still have a very high bandwidth and focus even more on some other elements like the narrative layer. Think of Uncharted 4. It has of course multiplayer, but I would assume most people play it for the single player and here it's the strongest. The new God of War is probably a better example, but it's also a longer game. With all those layers present, you probably don't have a playtime comparable to games like Dota 2, League of Legends or Counter-Strike Global Offensive, but you still have tons of content. You just experience it in parallel, so to say with a high bandwidth. And I think here Sea of Thieves is different. As mentioned, the price was chosen on a level that competes with all other new AAA games. With Microsoft and Rare as one of their first party studios behind it and around 200 people employed at Rare, it's also reasonable to assume Sea of Thieves is a AAA game too. When we now look at what Sea of Thieves is lacking compared to let's say Uncharted 4. Minimal narrative and almost no story. Almost no complex cutscenes. NPC characters have only few voice acted lines. Minimal enemy variety. The level design layer also seems to be not as complex. Exploration seems to be a bit minimal or let's say not rewarding enough. Progress also feels not rewarding and there are not many playtime stretches in the game. Not really great single player content, not many different multiplayer modes. We see that some of the layers are almost empty in comparison. The game is missing a lot of those elements. As a result, it has a lower content bandwidth. In addition, it seems it's only good for maybe 10 to 15 hours. And I think that's basically the reason why people think it has not enough content. But in the chart you also see that for example the game design layer peaks really high and here is a little counter argument that there is actually more content than people think. But also a reason why people don't see it or if they do some probably don't like it. With this we come to my second point. What actually is Sea of Thieves for a game? Well, while Uncharted 4 is a third person action adventure, Sea of Thieves is a, well I don't know, it's multiplayer, it's definitely designed as a co-op and PvP game. It's first person and has shooter elements, but nobody would call it an FPS. It has sword fighting, but it's also not really a game about sword fighting. It has ships and combat and fetch quests in a pirate setting with FPS, action adventure and open world sandbox elements. Maybe the most fitting genre would be a simulation game, but it's also not a simulation because it does not want to be realistic. So maybe it's a soft simulation in a romantic pirate setting. 
It's like the kids playing pirate simulator. And here I think lies a problem. Mechanically it's everything and nothing to its full extent but somehow in a good way. And this is very difficult to communicate to your customers in the game. How do you communicate in game that this game is not about grinding treasure and quest giver levels when this is actually an option to play the game? The main focus of the game is definitely co-op, PvP, ship control and ship combat. This is where the game has its strengths. To understand this better we have to dive a bit into the core game design of Sea of Thieves. It reminds me a bit of games like Mount and Blade but especially Zelda Breath of the Wild as a simulation heavy game. In my opinion Zelda has a very elegant game design. It's almost unreal that a game like this can exist as triple A game and be so polished. I can't show footage of Zelda so I keep it short. What makes Breath of the Wild so special is that it's design wise as mentioned incredibly simulation heavy. That means the outcomes of the player's actions are almost unpredictable or undetermined by the developer or the game design because the player can do whatever he wants and the world and mechanics only react to the player's actions but rarely limit him on his path through the game. There are of course limitations in the game but the player can get really creative when it comes to solving problems. A problem the game throws at you can often be solved by using the games and world's abstract rules and not only by using one or two pre-designed paths that the developers implemented. Of course many games are good at hiding pre-designed paths but there is still a difference between those design philosophies. A problem with this freedom is that you need to communicate to the player a basic direction else they can easily get lost not knowing what to do. Sea of Thieves is often pretty similar. It gives you the tools. How you use those tools is up to you. Sometimes you can use them in a very inefficient way and sometimes inefficient ways are very fun. Breath of the Wild does this over its implementation of physics. Sea of Thieves does this partially too but they also try to design game elements in a way that they have naturally multiple possible interactions that can be used as an advantage or disadvantage. So SOT is probably in many areas not as physics based as Breath of the Wild when it comes to game mechanics but it tries to achieve something similar with other elements. To guide the player in a basic direction so he is not lost the game has implemented quests called voyages. And you could come to the conclusion that this is what you do in the game but they are actually only a framework to get the player going into a more or less defined direction and use all those tools. The quest is not the fun but the tools are. So what is the core game design idea for the player in Sea of Thieves? It seems the developers made these very simple designed quests to get you going out into the world and enhance while you play them, becoming a different adventure for the player every time. And I have to admit I really like this concept. I would go as far as it actually works pretty well. Completing the voyage is not actually the goal but the journey is. You could say the journey is the destination. So what does this mean concretely? Let's look at one of the three quest types in the game and how it can turn out on paper. The quest I chose for this example is a merchant alliance voyage that could exist in the game this way. It's basically a semi open delivery quest. You talk to an NPC and he gives you a piece of paper with a list of animals with a specific color, a date and the name of an outpost where you have to bring those animals until the date expires. Sounds boring doesn't it but game design wise there's more to it. The idea of the developers is now that the player especially when he is new to the game has to get specific cages from the quest giver NPC, bring them on board and explore islands because he does not know what animal live on what island at least when he does not look it up. So it clearly encourages exploration of the world. Also knowing that those quests exist a smart player would probably memorize or note what animals he has found already on what island while doing other quests which can generate an investment and knowledge of the world. For example in Dark Souls a lot of players memorize automatically or unconsciously what enemies drop what types of titanite so they can upgrade their weapons later. 
When the player or the crew finds an island with the right animal, he has to carry the fitting cage to the island and catch the correct animal. Sometimes you have to search for a while or are very unlucky and don't find an animal with the needed color. So you have to continue exploring other islands. This can be quite annoying. That's also probably why those quests are a bit unpopular. You now sail to the next island, but on your way you see birds circling above a mast that sticks out of the water. A shipwreck. You and your crew decide to check it out, so you change your course and sail to the wreck, which is a little detour. Of course other players can see the birds too, which can lead to conflicts, but you don't see anybody around. You dive down and are lucky. You have found very valuable treasures while nearly drowning and getting eaten by sharks. You bring it aboard your ship and continue exploring. With this something changes. You now have treasure on your ship and something to lose. So you are probably now sailing far more cautious than before, looking out for other ships constantly and probably avoiding a fight if possible, which brings a bit of tension. In addition, some treasures glow and can be seen by other players from afar if not placed carefully. So attacking you and stealing your treasures becomes attractive to other crews. After a while you reach another island and you are lucky you find two animals you need and put them into your cages. Let's say two pigs. A more experienced crewmate also finds a message in a bottle at the beach while looking for bananas. Why bananas you ask? Well bananas are like potions and heal the damage you have taken and you can only carry five. But you can store more on your ship. In addition, you also have to feed your pigs, else they die. A frustrating lesson learned by one of the players in your crew in a previous voyage. Now with the two pigs on board, you only need one additional snake. But the message in the bottle had two treasure maps and a riddle in it. The island mentioned in the riddle is next to your current position, so you decide to go there first. On the island you have to find a specific place hinted in the riddle. You start searching the island and remember that you also have to feed the pigs. So your mate goes back to the ship and feeds them. It slowly becomes night and you found the spot. Suddenly pirate skeletons come out of their grave attacking you. After defeating them you can now dig up the treasure. It's your unlucky and lucky day at the same time. It's a chest of sorrow. This chest cries at times and if it's on your ship it quickly fills the ship with water to the point that it can sink. So someone has to bucket the water out when the chest starts crying. In the meantime your mate has found a cave with another chest in it. So more treasure for you. You both return to your ship and feed the pigs again. Your mate readies his bucket and you continue to sail to the next island where you see snakes. You take the last cage and your mate stays on board to get rid of the water. You have to play music because snakes attack you if you come too close, which will poison you, what makes you also see less. But music calms them down and you can catch and carry them safely. But since your mate must stay on the ship, you have to drop the snake several times and play music or live with the poisoning for some time, which delays your way back. When you are getting close to your ship, you suddenly see another ship coming close too, a sloop. Without the delays, you would be already sailing away. You hurry, inform your busy mate, place a snake on board and ready your ship as fast as possible. But one enemy shot himself over to you with a cannon. But at least you are moving. You fight on board with him while the other ship is shooting at you. Of course, the chest of sorrow is still crying. Therefore, the enemy gets poisoned by the snake you placed on board and you can kill him fast. Your mate can now return to bucket the water out and feed the pigs while you repair the holes and try to not maneuver your ship into an island or rocks in the water. At the same time, you have to control the sails so you go as fast as possible because the other player ship is right behind you. You both heal with bananas and notice not many left. When the chest stops crying again, you turn around and engage. You mate fires several cannon shots and manages to even kill one of the other players with a direct hit. You turn around and continue shooting at the ship. Your mate decides to board them too and shoots himself over with a cannon. While the remaining player is busy repairing, he pulls their anchor and fights with the remaining enemy. When the other player respawns after like 50 seconds, your mate fights him too until he dies. But you have made as much distance as possible and they are close to sink. 
Again, you feed the pigs with the last bananas and sail to your destination, which is luckily the next outpost. Also, your mate respawns on your ship and you decide to complete the voyage before you sail to the other islands from the message in the bottle. A bit stressed, you reached your destination and deliver the animals and yeah booty. Then you sit down at the campfire while playing music until you see a huge skull-like cloud appearing on the horizon. This could actually happen in a game and this is also their design idea. The game has many events and elements that will constantly distract you from doing those voyages. So they are simply fetch quests but can expand to a unique adventure. If we look at the game design, snakes are designed to limit your movement on your ship. Pigs need to be fed, which drains your banana supply but also limits the time you have when not aboard of your ship. Those game elements are more than just dead objects in your inventory. Design-wise, they are far more interesting than the items you have to carry in classical delivery quests we know from, for example, many RPGs. The chests can also have special effects like the chest of sorrow that gives you a task you have to constantly care about, limiting your efficiency on the ship. On the other side, you can also use those elements to do totally different things with them that are not quest related. For example, you can actually use snakes to defend certain areas of your ship against boarding. But of course, they can also hinder yourself. You can in theory think an enemy ship with a chest of sorrow or at least keep them busy for a while. There are more elements in the game that allow you to become quite creative that I won't spoil here. And I think these elements actually give more content variety than you might think. The game can easily become the messing around with other player simulator, which is a lot of fun, especially with friends. Designing, balancing and playtesting elements like this is much more work than simply designing more standard quests we see in many other games. Still, there is a huge problem with Sea of Thieves. There are simply not enough of those elements in the game. There are only three animals and only two special chests in the game and one other interesting object. An increase of those elements with interesting side effects could create many more options for the players to interact with the world and each other. There's also an AI thread in the game which appears somewhat randomly but can create tense moments in the game, especially when you are carrying a lot of treasure. There's also the Skeleton Fort event which is visible to all players and gives a great reward, which leads to great interactions between players because it pops up and multiple crews usually sail towards it. So this becomes a PvPvE hotspot in the game which can be really fun. I once allied with another crew in the past to get the treasure and in the end we were successful and split it. Those situations are really great because you never know if someone will double cross you in the end, creating a lot of tension and gameplay variety. The game really shines here and it becomes clear that content and stories in the world are actually created by players. This game is a multiplayer game, less like World of Warcraft but more like Minecraft in an abstract way. Still, it would be great if there would be more of those elements and indeed a new one is announced for the next and first big content update coming in May 2018. 100 people are working on new content updates for Sea of Thieves according to Rare's roadmap video, so there is potential. However, the initial release still feels a bit too empty because there are not enough of those elements and it feels like the developers missed some opportunities like randomly exploring islands does not feel rewarding enough. There are some hidden and secret places but no interactions with them yet. Why not build in hidden NPCs, illusory walls or global riddles that require you to find clues in the world on multiple islands, probably even together with other crews, that lead to a world event. At least it sounds like that this is what the developers are aiming for in the future. When it comes to the game's perception, interestingly it seems many players are used to grind towards a specific goal in games. In Sea of Thieves we have the rank of Pirate Legend, which requires you to bring all three faction reputations or levels to 50. It's really a huge grind, but getting it seems not worth it at all. It does not really offer you new endgame content or anything. 
Also, the developers did not expect that people would actually start grinding this title over weeks, compromising the actual fun of the game by doing those quests repetitively without leaving the quest pass and cancelling inefficient voyages and coming up with strategies how to solve them as fast as possible, which partially got patched out. It seems the gaming community is used to tediously grind their way up to max level MMORPG style, but Sea of Thieves is not an MMORPG and not designed for you to grind Pirate Legend, but reach it on the go at some point. It says a lot about industry standard designs when players intuitively start grinding towards some stupid title. However, the developers probably have underestimated this habit in the gaming community. The idea is just to play with friends, having a good time, getting distracted from your initial goal and having unique adventures based on how the world reacts to you, fighting or allying with other players young and old. The variety in age in this game is also quite impressive, but also the variety in player types. It's for more casual players who play some hours once a week, but also for more hardcore gamers, at least some who theory craft on topics like what's the fastest way to sail against the wind with perfect execution. Now knowing all this, why does it still feel like there's not enough? I think the game has simply not enough content bandwidth for its price tag in its release date. Its core game design loop becomes repetitive at some point. In this price class and as Microsoft first party title, it competes with other AAA games that clearly have more to offer. The standard these days for AAA games are quite high. When it comes to this, content bandwidth is king. It also seems a game design focused on more freedom and providing almost all information without an user interface by smartly using audio visual designs has not enough value these days. If the game would be like 30 dollars or euros, I think the perception of the game by many critics would not have been that negative or average. And of course, you could argue that they will expand the game with free updates, but we can only evaluate what is there, not what will be probably there at some point. For me, it's an outstanding good game that does so many things right, but does not enough yet. However, there will be content updates and Rare is very transparent in their decision making on future development. The roadmap and reprioritizing it indicates that they have understood where the problems lie. All future game content updates will be free and only cosmetics will have microtransactions to secure funds for future content updates and profit for the companies involved. I'm looking forward to it and I see the game taking up steam again after two or three content updates, if they are good and marketed well. The game has huge potential and sadly right now they make you invest blindly into the potential with a very high price tag, especially in Europe or Australia. However, I can't recommend to buy yourself into the hope of potentially good content updates in the future. Wait for the updates and see how well they are received. At least if you are not convinced yet with the game that exists right now. Still, I can't share the consensus that the game is bad. It's not. Graphically it looks gorgeous. Best water I have ever seen in a game. They nail the concept of a simple quest evolving into a complex adventure you would not have expected before. But you have to understand that this also requires to engage in situations and take risks, especially interacting with other crews, be it friendly or in combat. If you strictly grind quests, the game becomes boring, especially if you play alone. But if you sink your ship and sneak upon other crew's ships to steal their treasures or cause confusion, you can have the time of your life. Of course, this kind of playstyle is not for everyone, but that is actually a big part of what the game is about. The game is mess around with others, not grind boring quests for 300 hours. If you want to try it out yourself, you can get two weeks of the Xbox Game Pass for free, which includes playing the full version of Sea of Thieves for those two weeks. And because the digital version of the game is also part of the Play Anywhere program, this works not only for Xbox One, but also for PC and you don't need an Xbox One at all. This should give you a good idea of the game and if it's something for you or not. Only downside, you have to use the Microsoft Store. Thank you for watching.
This video took me a while, probably because I had too much fun playing it, but also finding out why the game feels a bit like it misses content and writing this down. The script went through tons of iterations, which is reflected by it almost being a, a closer look at what is content than a review. Also, Sea of Thieves is quite hard for me to say at times. If you liked it, feel free to press the like button and also share your thoughts on Sea of Thieves and on this review style, which is a bit different. I want to focus my gaming content more on specific topics for the future. For example, the idea of content in a game like in this video. There are too many generic reviews out there, so spicing it up a little should result in more interesting videos. This was more a hybrid, but I think I want to go more into the direction of a closer look at videos. Next video will be most likely the second episode of my The Story Behind the Fellowship of the Ring series. Feedback was amazing. Someone suggested in the comments calling it The Law of the Rings, which I really like, so maybe I change the name. No clue how long it will be or when it will release yet. Shorter videos means more frequent uploads, which is a huge problem on my channel, I guess. As I said before, I aim for at least 15 minutes. I also plan on doing another more classical law video next month, but no idea how this will work out. And in June is E3, so I would love to make a guesstimating video before. My E3 coverage this year will be a bit different though and hopefully be more interesting. Pretty much a similar approach as in this video, so more focused, but this also depends on what's at E3. Beyond that, I have an idea for a very complex video related to a game that will probably come out at some point. It will be almost like a lore video, but not about Lord of the Rings and Tolkien. The time has to be right and it looks like something for 2019 or even 2020. It's not Cyberpunk 2070. Happy speculating on what that could be. Again, thank you for watching and goodbye.